or solicitation to sell any of the solutions. Um, and you should uh, certainly ensure that uh, you are taking uh, specific personal advice uh, on your own portfolio before you make any determinations uh, for any investment ideas. Moving on, we do have a Slido poll. And in fact, if you were to log into Slido right now, you'll be able to see a poll question. And uh, we, we certainly do welcome your responses. We will reveal the results of uh, the poll at the end of the session. So just do log in and uh, do put in any questions that you may have. We will spend some time towards the end to answer the key questions uh, that you have posed to us this evening. So just do bear with us for the time being. Now to the agenda proper for today. The objective is to showcase uh, FunSmart. And as you all know, FunSmart is a platform that allows you to construct your own fund or funds portfolio. So I'm also going to touch on a few key principles as to how best to go about constructing a diversified portfolio. And many of you are right now interested in income solutions. And I'll cover specifically for income. If we were to build a portfolio, what are the key things that you should be looking out for? And likewise, what would be the pitfalls? For the month of June, we're very excited because we have got 11 new funds that we have added onto FundSmart. So today we're going to take some time to go through all 11 funds with you to share what were our findings during the due diligence process and to give you more insights on each of the funds so you can make an informed decision if the funds are going to be suitable for your portfolio. And finally, we will do a demo on how FundSmart can be utilized on the platform to go through with you the steps um, and likewise, also to show you where on our website you can find a full list of solutions. With that, let me first of all kickstart with the introduction. So, okay, FunSmart, I think some of you may not be aware, but we have launched uh, FunSmart for some time already. And so what you might be more familiar with be the Advice Portfolio or CareSmart. But FunSmart, uh, it's certainly something worthwhile for you to consider because that's where we, you can go to customize your own personal portfolio. All the funds that today we're using uh, for advice portfolio or for CareSmart are actually available on FunSmart as well. But the key here is that uh, you can set your goals. You can also, of course, assess your own suitability and likewise run the projections be in terms of expected return or volatility, and look for something that is more aligned with your requirements. So for FunSmart, I think the good and easy way is that uh, you can always run different permutations. You can, of course, uh, go in there and also select the different funds just to see the details, and you don't have to go to the website itself. So the mobile app is already something that uh, is visible today. And it's really fast and efficient. So personally, when I first started my Endowas account, I used FunSmart. You can say that's because I'm a super user. But the truth is that uh, it is a very easy. It's much easier for me to set up a funds portfolio compared to other platforms that I'm also using. And as all of you are aware, you can execute the portfolio securely. It is very much the same as what we have with uh, CashSmart and also advice portfolios. So it will be still executed and held in custody at UOB Kahian. So that doesn't change at all. I will now want to move to an example on what it means to build your own funds portfolio. Some of you are already aware that Endowas uh, provides a very low cost uh, set of solutions for you. But I want to reiterate that there are some differences when we look at different share classes. So while there are no sales fee, no transaction fee, and you can assess institutional share class, and you can get trailer fee rebate, you will see two different types of outcomes when you select funds with us. So I'll start off with the example on the left-hand side. 
Himco Income Fund is something that's very popular. I think it's becoming a household name. And if you have been buying the PIMCO Income Fund from banks out there or from other financial advisors, you will realize that you will be typically assessing the retail share class. And the retail share class has a total expense ratio of 1.45%. However, if you are able to assess the institutional share class, which otherwise, in most instances, uh, for most funds out there, you require a large ticket and the sizing would be typically 1 million to assess the institutional share class. Of course, it's called institutional because the institutional investors out there are the ones that have got assessed. But we want to bring this assess to you as individual investors. And if you can assess the institutional share class, your cost savings is going to be dramatically increased. Just looking at a comparison there, the institutional share class is charging 55 basis point on a total expense ratio basis. So you are saving already 90 basis point just by making sure that you're picking up the institutional share class and you're making a conscious decision as part of your process to build a portfolio to look for the lowest cost alternative for every single fund out there. And for us, when you come to us to assess the institutional share class, and ours doesn't have a minimum, right? You have a minimum to set up a portfolio at $1,000. But thereafter, even if you want to spend $100 just investing into something like the Pico Income Fund, you can and you will get the institutional assets. So I think that's something that's very important as a takeaway. On the right-hand side, there is a second example that I want to share with you. And this would be instances where there is no institutional share class, right? We're talking about a situation that it is not launched in Singapore. There's no sing dollar institutional share class. But what will be beneficial for you would be still to assess the retail share class, but you get back the rebate. So many of my friends ask me, what exactly is a rebate? A rebate essentially is a refund of the trailer fees that otherwise would be paid to an intermediary. So when fund managers are distributing their funds, they always pay the intermediary a fee. So for as long as you hold a fund in the portfolio, the intermediary, be it a bank or a financial advisor, will benefit from receiving the trellis that is coming from your holdings and you are paying for it. No one else is paying for it. You are paying for it. It's coming out of the total expense ratio. We as an ad and ours do not take trailers. And therefore, it is going to result in cost savings for you. We pass the trailers back to you. So you see that in the form of a trailer fee rebate. So in this instance with the Fullerton Asian Short Duration Bond Fund, Literally, if you buy it on other platforms, you're going to be paying 0.87% on the total expense ratio. But if you were to come to us, it will be at 0.5%. So again, I think this is an important differentiation. There are different ways in which you can benefit. And I want to illustrate a point that while there could be instances where institutional share class is cheaper, if institutional share classes are not available in Singapore, not in Sing Dollar, it's not Sing Hedge, Sing Reference, etc. Go with the retail share class, but the retail share class, we are also making sure that it is cheaper for you compared to elsewhere. Okay, now let's move on. We talked earlier about what it means to construct a portfolio. So now that you know that there are cost savings, let me try and share with you what it means to build your own portfolio using FundSmart. So let's just first take a look at what are the things you'll be considering. Having a goal in mind is the most important thing. We always start off with the end in mind, which is what exactly do I want to achieve from creating this investment portfolio? And I think people in my age group do have a higher amount of expenses. Usually we have got liabilities, we have got mortgages, we have got family members to take care of. And so we have a specific investment goal. I want my investment portfolio to help fund my expenses 
and helped by my liabilities. So that is something to think about. Um, clearly, as uh, we all grow older, retirement becomes a more important uh, goal and we all want to save towards uh, that objective. And in fact, personally, I would prefer to retire early. Uh, and I do think that by investing prudently, I can reach my goal a lot more easily. And the second thing is, of course, risk tolerance. I can't tell you what is your risk tolerance, to be honest. It is something that you have to assess based on your ability to withstand drawdowns in the portfolio and how you personally feel about market downturns. If, for example, back in March 2020, you started to panic and you sold off all your holdings, then you know for sure your risk tolerance is generally quite low. I think you need to ask yourself some of these questions. Um, in order to make sure that uh, you can also think about it, not just in terms of much drawdowns you can withstand, but more importantly, in terms of time horizon. Overall, I would say that the longer your time horizon, meaning you don't need the money tomorrow, you don't need the money in five years' time or 10 years' time, the longer it is, the more likely that you can withstand more volatility and therefore, your risk appetite should also be higher. And finally, I think a key thing is about diversification. Because we always say that diversification is the only free lunch when it comes to investing. Um, and of course, we do think that it is the baseline. We see a lot of investors with concentrated portfolios. And that worries me a lot. Because I feel that if you want to have a good night of ski, you do need to make sure that you are going to be spreading your eggs uh, across a much uh, wider basket. It's not going to be concentrated and it's not going to be something that can worry you because of certain event risks. And overall, I would summarize by saying that when it comes to our investment philosophy, at the end of the day, it's about making sure that uh, you believe that you stay in the market, don't try to time it, the longer you stay in there, the efficiency of the market will kick in and it will provide you with the compounded returns. So I think this is something that is essential. It's just the baseline when you think about customizing your own rather than using our advice portfolios. So moving on, let's just take a look at what it means to create an income portfolio. So recently we did a survey with uh, many of you who are already endow us clients and thank you so much for your responses. One of the key things that came up from the survey is that people like to receive income because it gives them that feel good vibe. That's why I have the cartoon there. People just feel good about receiving money. Even if you have no use for the money that you're receiving, it doesn't matter. It just feels really good to get something in your portfolio. And to be fair, I'm one of the Getty parties, I do like to receive distributions as well. Uh, it just makes me feel that the portfolio is growing, right? But I think there are always different portfolios for different purposes. If you are truly thinking about an income portfolio, and for this month, we've added quite a few in terms of income solutions, read solution. Think about it with these three different parameters. First one, stability. It is important that when you construct an income portfolio, you're looking for consistent as well as a, a fixed payout. You want it to be paid pretty much uh, on a consistent basis. So if I say I can get 4% from the PIMCO Income Fund, I want to see it coming in every month because I could be requiring the payouts just to fund my expenses, uh, just to fund, let's say, a hobby. If I've got a piano lesson and every month I need to out of pocket pay for it, I much rather that my portfolio is supplementing me for, for that kind of uh, hobbies. So I would say that a fixed payout is something you look out for. So when you're selecting funds, check for funds that have got a more regular payout to the extent that if they can fix it for that share class, it will be better. And I'll show you some examples of that as we go into the new funds for this one. The second one is about sustainability. 
So the key here is the underlying assets. I want assets to be high quality and they have got a predictable cash flow. Fixed income is, of course, a lot easier for predictability simply because you know that they have a fixed time frame to pay coupons. Usually, it's semi annual, a bond will pay you twice a year, and you know exactly how much they will pay. If it's a 4% uh, coupon, you will get that 4%, right? Unless that asset defaults, which is why I say high quality is very important. You want to make sure that it's a company that is sustainable. Default risk is low. You will be able to enjoy the longevity of the coupon until, let's say, the bond matures. So the concept is very much the same if you look at the fund because the fund is made up of many different bonds in there. Equities is usually a little bit less predictable, but you do have uh, many household names in there that you're familiar with. So companies, I think, is a different uh, way of uh, assessing high quality. It's more about your view on whether this group of companies are going to be able to generate uh, positive dividend growth every year and also be consistent in paying them out. And the third one, of course, is diversity. I think many of us uh, tend to feel that if I just buy a DBS bank and DBS pays me a 5% dividend, that's good enough. Truth of the matter is that you don't want to be just uh, in local banks. You want to diversify and multiple sources of income can come from different places. To give you an example, in the US, securitized assets, particularly asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities, uh, credit card receivables, and so on, are actually a very stable asset class. But because they are sort of far away from where we are here, we don't think about allocating to them. But if you were to use a manager who have got expertise in this area, you're going to have another new source of income. And these are not things that will default tomorrow, right? And I, I do have very good experience uh, in this area of uh, securitized assets. So I do think that we have to consider different areas. It could also be higher bonds, emerging market, I um, mean, I think there are different areas which today, if we just buy a single security, you will not be able to diversify as well compared to using a fund or unit trust to do this on your behalf. Okay, now that we cover the three baseline criteria, I want to share with you what happens uh, when uh, you forget about some of the pitfalls. So if we look at uh, what are the things that you could potentially be more conscious of. I would say the first one is, of course, high payouts. There are many funds out there that tell you that I'm giving you 8%, right? And I've seen another one that says 6.88% is the next best thing. And 8 somehow seems to be able to sell. So please, don't just look for high payout percentages. 8%, while it sounds auspicious, it's not sustainable. And do you know how they came out with the 8%? It's because they are paying out of capital. And you will see that the NAV of the fund will typically decline over time. And that's because they keep paying you back your own money. That's literally what's happening. And I really don't want you guys to get to the point where you sort of uh, get tempted because it's a high payout amount and you just look at the headline. I suggest that you consider funds who are more prudent, who don't have the tendency to pay out of capital um, and are going to be um, uh, more cautious when making sure that there is also room for some capital appreciation. Because what's going to happen is that if I keep paying you a high coupon, then literally there's nothing left to accumulate over time. And it is just going to be uh, a delayed situation of paying out of your own money. Um, and there are actually many funds out there with different kinds of policy. Even within the same fund, they have got different share classes with different payouts. Some do a fixed payout, others do a variable payout. Some will say that they will pay some of the coupons uh, or distributions that you see out of capital. Others will say that as a firm, they will never do it. So there are many things that, in fact, we consider as part of the due diligence process. 
And I just want to assure you that based on the funds that uh, we have introduced, we are very comfortable that we will avoid this kind of situation where you're just seeing a high payout, but you will see your capital depleting. The second thing is, of course, home buyers. Um, in Singapore, I think it's inevitable that uh, we're bombarded with um, decent level of payout from REITs, which is real estate investment trusts, and likewise also from blue chip stocks. So many of uh, our portfolios uh, with our, our local investors tend to see income being built up from only these two areas. I feel that this is very dangerous. So to give you an example, for last year in March 2020, we have seen a huge uh, drawdown in terms of REITs uh, and their price levels. And you know that with COVID-19, the retail industry has been badly hit. So if you assume that you had just bought a lot of retail REITs, right, because they were giving you like 5%, you have to go through that very difficult period of drawdown. And of course, even today, I don't think we can say that we're totally out of the woods. The retail industry is not going to bounce back that quickly. Um, and we're going to see COVID-19 with us for a much longer period of time. So I seriously urge you to avoid just buying stocks and REITs in Singapore. There are a lot more ways for you to achieve a 5% distribution from an income portfolio without necessarily just putting all your eggs uh, in, in Singapore positions. Um, and the third one is, of course, mistaking a decumulation portfolio for passive income. This happens uh, predominantly with our focus on retirement. So with retirement, we want to receive our income, perhaps to supplement what we're getting from CPF life uh, payouts. Um, many of uh, our friends and family would have annuity. But annuity, in my view, is an uh, insurance solution. You pay your premium up front. And when it's time for you to retire, you do get a monthly payout. <laughs> this is a mechanism where it is going to decumulate or redraw from your capital and principal amount month on month. It is actually not growing. And while you pay a premium today, over the course of the next, let's say, 20 years before I choose to retire, it is just going to make minute returns because most of the insurance company are just investing in government bonds for safety. So it's very low yielding. So you're not growing as much. And by the time you expect the annuity, you are again depleting from your principal amount. So conceptually, it's different. It's not an investment portfolio. So I seriously would want everyone to, again, reconsider. An investment portfolio should give you a regular income but your principal should at least remain more or less intact. There would be short-term fluctuation, but you should also be expecting some capital appreciation over time. So it's entirely different. And I think these are the three key pitfalls uh, that I wanted to share with you. All right, so moving on right now, I'm going to hand over the time to Yulin, who will start uh, by sharing the equity funds that are new on FundSmart. Yeah, thank you, Wei for the introduction. So um, in June, we brought on 11 new funds on FarmSmart. And in the next 15 minutes, I will walk through the key features, our selection criteria, as well as some investment considerations for the three new equity funds that we have added in FarmSmart. So the first one is United Global Durable Equities. Um, so firstly, although the fund is labeled as a fund from UOBSM Management, as you can see, I've put Wellington Management's logo here. It is actually managed by Wellington Management. So Wellington is a U.S. headquartered private and independent investment management firm. It manages a total of over U.S. one trillion of assets across different asset classes. Actually, most of Wellington's products are only available for accredited investors and for institutional investors. So in this case, you as a retail investor can have access to this fund because your BAM wraps it and uses its retail license to distribute to retail investors. So as you can see, the fund invests in global um, equities. And as the name suggests, it invests in durable businesses at moderate valuations. 
We will go through the investment philosophy and approach a bit later, but as a result of it, the fund will have a tilt to small size and quality, and it also has an underlying focus on downside protection and sustainable value creation. So it targets um, a 10% per annum return over a full market cycle with less risk than the market. And as shown here, it has actually nicely realized its return objective over the market cycle. And with a 13.8% volatility, it's since inception, it's actually quite a bit lower than a typical global large cap equity strategy. And I also want to highlight here that Indawas has negotiated special rebate with um, UOBAM so that if you buy this fund on any other retail platforms, you are actually paying 2.14%, which is ridiculously high. But um, with the rebate of 0.99%, actually the all-in fund level cost that you are paying on Indawas to access this fund is only 1.15%. Um, and let's move on. So this is the sector and regional allocation of the fund. So as mentioned before, the fund is pretty unconstrained. So the regional and sector allocation is actually just the fallout of the bottom-up security selection. And we can see here that geographically the fund is sorry, a little bit underweight Asia and overweight US and Europe compared to a typical um, MSCI World benchmark. And sectorally, it is quite overweight financials and industrials and underweight communication services compared to the same benchmark. So moving on, this is the summary of um, our fund rationales. So why we selected this fund. So firstly, um, it offers a really unique exposure to global equities. So now I want to go into the investment philosophy of this fund a little bit more. Um, durability in this strategy is defined as more stable than the market perceives. So a durable company has, for example, stable profit stream um, and sustainable value creation and also high quality management team that, you know, allocate the capital prudently. However, the merits of stability is already widely appreciated and therefore it's often reflected in the valuation of well-known stable businesses. So importantly, this strategy looks for durability in unconventional places. So it would find stable businesses in areas of the market perceived as unstable, such as small caps, more volatile sectors, and disfavored geographies. And it would also go into the companies that do not meet the specific criteria of growth, quality of value investors. And so this is a strategy that explores the duration of growth rather than the explosiveness of growth. And the result of this approach is uh, it's a high conviction portfolio with 20 to 25 to 50 holdings um, and a, a small fat, small size and quality tilt. And really importantly, it has very little or no overlap to popular names in a typical large cap global equity fund. Uh, we like this fund also because the fund is managed by an experienced team in Wellington management. Um, so the fund's lead portfolio manager is Daniel Posen. He has 19 years of investment experience, 14 of which are with Wellington. He has another three people on his team with an average of 21 years of experience. And in addition, he's also supported by the 55 global industry analysts. They are career analysts with really in-depth knowledge in the sectors that they cover. So um, Dan and his team operate as a boutique structure. And this is why they can stay true to their investment approach because despite being to the big organization, this setup makes sure that the investment team is entrusted to generate their own independent opinions um, and stick, stick true to their um, investment strategy. So um, yeah, if you're thinking about allocating to this fund, we will suggest that you use this fund to complement your exposure to a traditional global large cap equity allocation so that you can achieve better risk adjusted returns for your overall portfolio. And the next up is a United Asia Pacific Real Estate Income Fund. Um, this is a fund that invests in real estate investment trusts in the Asia Pacific region, and it aims to achieve total return 
consisting of both income, meaning dividends paid from the underlying holdings, and capital appreciation. So in case you are not so familiar with what a REIT is, here's a quick explanation. Um, so a REIT company usually owns, operates, or finances real estates, properties. And if you own you know, a, a REIT company, you, if you invest in it, that means you own part of it and you have exposure to the real estate portfolio that they operate. And by regulation, um, real estate investment trust needs to distribute 90% of its taxable income to shareholders in the form of dividends. This is why it is traditionally thought of as an income generating investment. And the fund is available for both cash and SRS in um, investment. Historically, it has realized 13.4% volatility since inception. This is something to note because after all, it is still an equity investment. It's not investing in a physical property. So it's mark to market which means you will still see equity-like um, volatility that will move the price up and down in, the, in a short period of time. As when we mentioned in COVID, um, March, the drawdown last year, actually the whole REITs market just collapsed. But um, on a longer time horizon, it has delivered decent return. So um, for example, the five-year annualized return is 6.11% after, after, after fee. And Again, in Dallas has negotiated a special trailer fee rebate to lower the cost to 1.5% from 2.49%. Yeah, um, and we have onboarded the fund's distribution share class, which targets 4.5% distribution in 2021. And currently uh, in Dallas will automatically reinvest the distribution on behalf of you, but you can choose to withdraw the amount that you need from your investment. So the regional and sector allocations here are pretty intuitive. The fund allocates about 40% to Japan, which is the largest REITs market in Asia. It then allocates the rest of its capital to Singapore, Hong Kong and Australia REITs companies. And in Dallas have selected this fund because first of all, it is the purest and most diversified APAC REIT fund available in Singapore. So there are some other REIT funds, but they either blend in allocation to property developers or they exclude Japan in its allocation. I mean, there is nothing wrong in those approaches and they have their own merits as well. But if investors just want pure exposure to all parts of the REITs market, then this is the fund to buy. And the fund is also managed by an experienced uh, investment team. So the fund is actually managed by UOBAM in collaboration with Sumitomo Mitsui Asset Management. Colin Yen and Su found on the portfolio managers from UOBAM, and they have an average of 20 years of investment experience. So they would manage the Asia X Japan part of the portfolio. And the Japan part is actually self-advised by the team from Sumitomo Mitsui Asset Management. So they have being in the real estate investment space for over 20 years, and they have on the ground experience in Japan. Um, and actually, um, Sumitomo Mitsui AM is a fully owned subsidiary of UOB AM. And the collaboration between the two have been very long and successful, which is reflected in its top tier track record since the fund's inception. Um, so if you are thinking about allocating to this fund, please note that capital appreciation for REITs fund tend to be very low after you take out the distribution. So it is not for long-term wealth accumulation if you're thinking about growing your wealth. Um, and in addition, REITs are not necessarily a safer asset class. By investing solely in APAC REITs, you can take on concentrated regional sectoral risk. So we advise that you really complement your portfolio with allocation to other asset classes after understanding your own investment objectives and horizon, just like what Wei Mei has mentioned. Okay, now moving on to the last equity fund that we have added. Uh, it's um, from AB Alliance Bursteins, Low Volatility Equity. This is Alliance Bursteins debut on Indawa's platform. So I will give a brief introduction of who they are. So they are a global investment management and research firm. Um, they, as of March 2021, they manage about USD 700 billion across their strategies. 
They are actually a pretty big retail farmhouse, and last year they won the award of Best Retail House in Asia Asset Management Best of the Best Awards. So this particular fund seeks to grow investors' capital over the long term by investing in developed market equities that are believed to have lower volatility and less downside risk. So it has realized a volatility of 14.3% since inception and about 10% um, five-year annualized return. Importantly, now here it's a real-life illustration of uh, Indas offering institutional share class. So um, it is the cheapest share class available for this fund. And it's usually only accessed by institutional investors. And actually, this share class does have a minimum 1 million investment uh, requirement. But um, Indawas have managed to you know, waive this minimum. So you can um, invest in this uh, fund with any amount that you have in mind, starting from $100. Let's take a look at the regional and sectoral allocation of this fund. So for this fund, it's pretty well balanced as compared to the MSCI World benchmark with small underweight and overweight positions here and there as a result of the bottom-up security selection. Um, so here is the, the, the reason of why we select the funds. Um, first of all, we really like its focus um, and feature of downside protection during market volatility. It's um, the investment philosophy that underpins this strategy is actually winning by losing less. So they employ um, a quantitative as well as fundamental investment process to identify companies that are of higher quality than the market, that are uh, with cash flows that are more stable than the market, and where the market has not fully priced these attributes. And this process has worked well to provide balanced exposure to quality, stability, and reasonable price, and in times of market volatility, have provided downside protection. So to give you some um, reference, um, the fund has realized an equity beta around 0.8 and downside capture of 70% since its inception. In addition, um, the fund has also integrated ESG considerations in its bottom-up fundamental analysis process. So actually, the analysts need to conduct proprietary analysis on other ESG issues and reflect that as an additional dimension of the due diligence that would either reinforce their investment conviction or actually reduce their investment conviction. And the fund is classified under the European a sustainable finance disclosure requirement, SFDR, as an Article A fund. So an Article A fund, by definition, promotes environmental or social characteristics or both together, provided that the companies in which the investments are made follow good governance practice. And if you are considering allocating to this fund, please do note that while it offers downside protection, it does not necessarily capture all the market performance when the market goes up. So the upside capture is around 90%, it's not 100%. And the fund has historically offered equity market-like return over a full cycle with less volatility. So on a risk-adjusted basis, it does better, um, but it tends to smooth that return over time. So you won't see that much volatility and the return is also just kind of um, similar to a broad equity market exposure. Yeah, so that's it for the new equity funds for the month of June. I'll hand over the time to Wei Mei to introduce the fixed income funds that have we have onboarded. Thank you, Yulin. So moving on to fixed income, we do have eight different funds. So the first one would be the Alliance Bernstein Short Duration Higher Portfolio. So for this one, so if you look at the composition, it's pretty much going to be more focused uh, on making sure that duration is kept to less than four years. And overall, when we look at higher, the fund is going to be more focused on uh, the issuers that are more highly rated. So within higher, you can have double Bs as well as single Bs, but you sort of would be focusing less on the triple Cs. So that's what we mean by the higher quality issuers within the higher space. The fund is relatively big at 1.8 billion, but volatility given the short duration is going to be 
tapped to about 4.6% on an annualized basis. So I think this is a, a effective solution if you do want to assess a high yield. And performance-wise, uh, it has also been consistent. It incepted back in uh, 2011. Um, and if we are looking at today, what's the portfolio duration? It's at 2.44 years. Credit quality at B+. plus. So it is definitely a higher quality fund that we have uh, been uh, searching for within a higher space. And some of the peer groups, you will see it will go down to double B minus uh, and so on. So if we move on to the next page, you will see the uh, sector allocation. It's going to be predominantly in the U.S. because uh, the U.S. has got the deepest debt when it comes to high yield versus that of uh, Europe uh, or even Asia. Um, and structurally in the U.S., the higher market is overall already fairly short in terms of uh, the duration as well as maturity. Uh, so it is a, a good space to be picking up uh, a good selection of bonds. Um, and therefore, you will see that uh, if you are looking at the mix there, it's predominantly going to be corporates, right? Um, and that's where the majority of the year pickup is coming from. Moving on to the fund rationale. I just want to touch on a few key findings that uh, we have picked up during the due diligence process. First of all, the focus here is very much on limiting the downside. Uh, just given what I mentioned about higher quality and shorter duration, but we have also seen that the fund can use derivatives to hedge uh, on the downside. Uh, and if they want to, they can try and mitigate duration risk. The second thing would be in terms of the PMs. So the lead PM, Jashon, has been uh, in the industry for 24 years. Highly experienced, most of uh, his career has been with uh, Lance Bernstein. And his team is involved uh, in all the other higher strategy that the firm manages as well. Um, so they do have sufficient amount of assets within a higher space. So I think there's going to be sufficient longevity. And if you ask me, this is a team that has been tried and tested. And importantly, when it comes to the investment process, Overall, Alliance Bernstein likes to use a fair amount of technology in their processes. So they focus on faster information dissemination, which will help them uh, make decisions uh, a lot quicker. Um, and particularly right now in the US, uh, you do see a lot of new issues coming to the market as well, right? They'll be priced the same day. So you do need to make up your mind fairly quickly. And I think a platform and a framework uh, that is leveraging on technology will work best. Um, likewise, we also see that uh, they do streamline their process with uh, common research frameworks. Uh, so they can tap on all their analysts. And I think with high year, you do need bottom-up credit research. So it is important. You do need to focus on fundamentals. So this is uh, an important part. Um, I also want to touch on the fact that this fund may not capture the full upside on global high year. Uh, predominantly because it is uh, going to be more high quality, which means that if we have got the economy roaring and doing extremely well, you should expect even triple C's to outperform because it's going to be a case where there is going to be uh, bonds that will get re-rated, triple C's will become double B's uh, and so on. And in that kind of situation, because the fund is less exposed to lower quality bonds at this juncture, they would not uh, benefit from a full upside. Uh, however, you do get exposure to credit indices uh, in this strategy, and that can help the fund maximize liquidity. So it will also mean that in a down market, the fund would be more liquid than others. Typically, if you are buying triple C rated securities, the bid offer spread is by far wider. CDX will be much better. Um, and also, if we have got liquidity crunch, uh, you're going to get uh, the body for the fund to be able to unwind positions a lot quicker if you are using some credit indices. The current distribution year is at 3.4%. Um, and like Yulin mentioned, at, as of now, Endowas will reinvest the distribution for you. But we do have plans later this year to switch on the distribution capability. So you will have the ability to receive the distribution and send it to your bank account. But more on that uh, as we progress uh, into the second half of 2021.
Moving on to the next one. The next one is still from AB. <laughs> it's not that we like AB a lot, okay? But AB does have a lot of good fun. And uh, of course, it's also the first time that uh, Andalas has partnered with them. So we've chosen the best uh, from their suite of solutions, which we feel is going to be most appropriate for investors who are focusing on income. So as the name suggests, this is uh, covering America. It is uh, focusing on US. But I do see some questions around whether these are sing dollar based solutions. So rest assured, whatever we show you tonight is all sing dollar share class. And they are hedged uh, on the fixed income side. So you can uh, certainly gain exposure to other countries, but yet uh, use your thing dollars to invest. So this one is extremely big, and this is like a flagship solution for AB, right? It's at 33.6 billion. And I have to admit that I hardly see funds that are this big, but while it's big, it has also been effective. And you do see that over a five year time frame, the annualized return is at 4.33%. Very low volatility as well at 4.76%. It goes way back to 1993. Um, and today, if we just look at the year towards on the portfolio, it's at 3.95%. Portfolio duration is at 5.11. Generally, still shorter than what you get with uh, what I would deem as uh, much safer fixed income solutions. So if you're looking at uh, government bonds in general um, or Bond funds that only bind to sovereigns, you will see much longer duration that, than this. Those would be typically around six to seven years. If we look at the geographical mix, I think no surprises. On the next page here, you will see that uh, it's all US. Um, you'll learn on the next slide, please. And what I want to mention here is about sectors, because American income is interesting. It covers multiple sectors. And the one that I like best, of course, securitized. If you don't already know, I have a huge passion for securitized assets. And it is in this fund. Um, and you do get corporate exposure as well. So it is definitely a multi-sector approach. Let me now take you through the rationale on the next page. What uh, this portfolio advocates is what we call a barbell. And you might hear this very often, right? For those of us who go to the gym, a barbell gives you weights on both sides. So the weights here would be Gavis as well as corporates. And they allow the fund to technically allocate to riskier sectors. Um, and it could be higher, it could be characterized assets, right? So to give you an analogy, if I have got a barbell, I start off with 5 kgs on each side. Later on, I'll add more 1 kg weights across both right and left. So the 1 kgs would be just like your tactical overweight. That's how I would see it. But your barbell would be stable. You always have garbies on one hand and you will always have corporates on the other side. And I think this uh, diversification has helped them mitigate drawdowns because you don't have all sectors underperforming at the same time. Let's just assume a recessionary scenario. In that kind of environment, treasuries will outperform or garbies will outperform and corporates may underperform. So you do get some protection because usually that barbell can help support each other. Um, and you are looking at harvesting yield from multiple number of different sources. Goes back to my point that you need to have different income streams. And this is one fund that gives you many different income streams. The team in this case uh, is averaging about 25 years in experience. Uh, there are about eight of them that are involved. So I think it's really good. There is no key man risk uh, in such a solution. And you do have all of them for who are able to carry their own weight. They do make sure that from a credit and quantitative perspective, they are supplementing their research. Um, and I also see that there is an ESG consideration. So this is an added benefit for those of you who have got uh, ESG also as a selection criteria. On the downside, given that the fund size is really large, right? We do think that at some point it may become capacity constraint. Currently, it's not, but I do want to sound a word of caution that maybe it will at some point. So don't expect this fund to be uh, always open. It can move into a soft close uh, situation. And I do see investors uh, being able to use this as a core U.S. fixed income exposure. So if you want to have uh, exposure to U.S. fixed income market, why not use this one? 
I think it's very diversified and uh, helpful for you in your portfolio. Okay, next one is still going to be A, B, <laughs> but this one is going to be on global income. Um, it's like a cousin of American income, but this one has got a mandate where they are able to focus uh, outside of the US as well. Um, the fund size is smaller, so you can see this is a little bit like the poorer cousin. But we don't carry such bias. I think for investors, uh, if you don't want to just focus on the US, you can go with a more globally diversified alternative. For this particular solution, uh, the year to us is a bit higher. It's at 4.43%. But it does have a slightly shorter track record compared to American income. And the family is in 2017. Volatility is also relatively low at around 5%. Um, and credit quality, it's still going to be investment grade on average at triple B plus. So if I look at uh, the next page, you will see that uh, the mix here continues to be a bit more skewed towards North America, which will cover Canada and Mexico as well. Um, but overall, when it comes to the approach, it is very similar. It is also quite diversified. On the fund rationale on the next slide, I want to share with you that the approach is fairly similar to what I mentioned earlier on the barbell. Um, and you do have a mix uh, and a balance between credit and interest rate exposure. I think what is different in this case is, of course, there's a slight structural bias to North America, despite having a, a global mandate. And it's also longer duration compared to AB American income. So you do get a bit of a year pickup for this solution. Uh, but it's certainly exposed to other regions uh, like Europe as well as uh, Latin America and Asia. So it is still going to be a global mix, unlike American income, which is uh, going to be only US focused. Okay, so enough for AB. Let's move on to a different fun house on the next page. And we have got Allianz. Okay, Allianz, I think, is interesting because. It is uh, part of a bigger parent. Allianz Global Investors uh, is part of Allianz Group, and they are headquartered out of Munich in Germany. And you do know that Allianz uh, is a fairly, I would say, common brand name if you are looking at insurance. That's because the parent company has both insurance and asset management. And Allianz Global Investors uh, was uh, launched in 1998 as the asset management arm, and their sister company is PIMCO, which uh, I think many of you are familiar with. So they're all part of the same family. Um, and of course, Allianz Global Investors uh, does cover a lot of the insurance money and also the pension funds uh, out of Europe. So they are very big. I would say that today they are at uh, about 589 billion in euros. So it's huge. And for this fund that we're looking at, while you may see that the strategy is only at uh, over 100 million, I want to emphasize that uh, they do have segregated mandates from institutional clients for this strategy. So in total, it's actually more than uh, 2 billion in terms of size. It's not small. So there will be uh, certainly other investors who are participating and utilizing the PM's capability. Global higher would be a slightly more volatile solution. You can see it from the volatility number there, which is close to 9%. Um, and the year to maturity is also a bit higher. It's at 4.37%, while duration is at 3.26 years. So while we still don't have uh, the three-year track record because they're seeing dollar share class in September 2019, if we look back earlier, back to uh, 2016, with uh, the US dollar or the euro share class. The fund has actually done well, which is why we decided to onboard it. I want to show you a bit more on the next page, which would be the sectors. So while it is global, there is also quite a fair bit uh, of uh, Europe in there. Um, and the managers are actually based out of Europe. So I have to say that they have a little bit more home bias. And that's something that uh, is worthwhile considering. Um, and on to the rationale, let's just go through a little bit on why we like this fund. 
they focus a lot on risk budget and you may not see it uh, in all fixed income funds. But when it comes to position sizing and downside risk management, having a risk budget and making sure that uh, you're tracking that and monitoring your portfolio accordingly and taking positions uh, by uh, using a risk budget is important. Um, the fund also focus on making sure that uh, they avoid defaults. And they, if they do have more distressed position, they tend to like to take the lead in the restructuring. Um, so it's a little bit more activist, I would say, where they are more hands-on. So that's unique. Uh, and if we compare to the peer group, they have indeed de delivered better risk-adjusted returns. The lead PM is a gentleman by the name of David uh, Newman, and he has uh, more than 33 years uh, of experience in the market. So I think it's a very secure pair of hands. His team um, has got more than 23 credit analysts, and they are also co-PMs. Uh, so I think it's very, very safe in terms of uh, individuals who know what they are doing. And the fund also has got ESG integration. Um, in particular, they have incorporated the climate engagement with outcome initiative. And they have also been engaging with uh, top emitters uh, within a portfolio to try and drive those companies uh, towards uh, a climate change uh, pathway. Um, so I think key consideration, which I've really mentioned earlier, would be the structural bias to Europe. Um, they are underweighted Asia almost consistently. So if you do like Asia, right, you do need to add Asia separately within your portfolio. This is not the fund that will give you large uh, Asian high exposure. Distribution here is 6%. So as you can see, they are paying more than the coupons. And what's happening is that uh, there is capital appreciation from the fund. So it's a mix of both coupons plus capital appreciation that gives you about a 6% payout. Uh, it may fluctuate but uh, they do try to fix it uh, usually for six months ahead of time. So that's where you get some predictability in terms of whether that 6% is going to be sustainable. The fund also has base currency in euros and the benchmark is actually euro hedge. So while you have a sing dollar share class, just take note that uh, unlike most other global higher funds which are dollar based, this one is actually euro based. Okay. Next, let's move on now to another fun house, Lake Mason Brandywine. Lake Mason, I think some of you are familiar. We have partnered with them. Uh, but the key thing is that Brandywine is actually a boutique within Lake Mason. Let me give you a little bit of history, who exactly is Brandywine. And please, they are not in the, the winemaking business. It just so happens that they are called Brandywine. Um, it was founded in 1986. And they became part of uh, Lake Mason in 1998. Um, and Lake Mason, as of last year, was integrated with Franklin Temperton. So they are now part of the broader uh, Franklin Temperton uh, organization. But Brandywine, on their own, have got $64 billion in terms of AUM. It is headquarters uh, of Philadelphia, um, but they do have offices in Toronto, London, and also Singapore. They tend to be more value-oriented uh, and more macro-focused when it comes to fixed income. So for the Brandy Wine Global Income Maximizer Optimizer Fund, um, the fund size is large. It's at $1.1 billion. And I think this is one of the favorites uh, out there simply because it is unconstrained. And probably this is the first time I'm talking about unconstrained throughout our session today. Unconstrained means that it's not benchmark-oriented. It doesn't care about what's in the benchmark. They do what they think is most appropriate, and therefore it can be viewed as uh, somewhat more dynamic and also being able to capture on different market opportunities. If you look at the five-year returns, it's at 5.79%, and volatility is relatively low, right, at about 4.59. So I'll say this is actually a very good fund uh, in my view. And it was incepted uh, back in 2013. The only key thing to take note is that the credit quality is not as high. It's not average investment grade. It is a double B. So just in case if you have got a certain view around credit quality, this one will not meet it because they tend to also focus uh, more on year pickup. 
Uh, of course, it's income optimizer, right? They want to give you the best income possible. So they will sometimes go down the credit curve. But duration is very low at three years. So I do think that it's useful, particularly if you're concerned about rising interest rates. Moving on to the next stage, you will see the sector mix. Country-wise, it's still going to be more US focused. But sector is right now about 70% corporate. But you do get securitized assets uh, and also government bonds in there. So it's quite a mixed bag. They are quite active in sector rotation. And if we look at the rationale, let's just touch on the process. It's both top down as well as uh, bottom up because it's important to have a country and sector perspective when you are trying to be more dynamic. But security selection also relies on fundamental analysis. There's also the other element where you will see durations uh, being uh, managed more actively. It can change uh, quite dramatically. Um, and they use uh, duration and credit uh, to also hedge on the downside. I like the fact that the drawdowns were limited last year. Um, in March 2020, when we had most funds uh, suffering from drawdowns, their drawdowns were limited to minus 5.6%. Whereas the peer group average was at minus 8.9%. And overall, Brandywine focuses more on a team-based approach. So there are no star managers. Um, and they tend to have a very strong bench of research analysts, most of them for averaging about 15 years of experience. Also with ESG, um, they have a fully integrated ESG research into their process. And there's an SFDR rating of Article 8. Um, so overall, the active sector locations uh, is there. So you just need to be aware that this is unconstrained. And finally, the distribution year is at 4.8% uh, right now. This is the most recent distribution year. Just take note that it will fluctuate. Uh, and I've seen it fluctuate quite a fair bit between about 3 to 5% range. So just give and take. This is not a fixed payout fund, um, but it is uh, certainly one that has multiple sources of income. Okay, next fund, and I, I'm almost coming to the end, so just bear with me. Thread Leader US Hire. Okay, Thread Leader is a new manager that uh, we're working with. So Columbia Thread Leader is a firm that's based out of Boston. They are in 17 countries with over 2,000 employees. So it's very large. They have AUM of about 564 billion in US dollars. Uh, and they have traditionally been covering uh, institutions and pensions. Um, they are actually a subsidiary of Ameriprise Financial. Uh, so for them, uh, asset management is a key part of their business. And for this fund that we have selected, it focuses uh, predominantly on US higher. Fund size is at 291 million. Volatility, of course, is a little bit higher than the multi-sector ones that we've seen so far at 6%. But the fund has got a very long track record. Right? It goes back to 2003. And annualized return over a five-year time frame is at 4.58%. Uh, average credit quality will be at B+. Plus, so you will see some differentiation versus uh, the earlier solutions like the AB1 that we were talking about that was a bit more high quality. Track neither if um, we were to go straight into the rationale. Um, Yulin, if we could skip. Yes. The rationale, I think... Predominantly because we are getting the full spectrum of securities. Earlier on, we touched on funds that only focus on double Bs and single Bs. This one gives you the full spectrum, right, including triple Cs. So it will benefit from full upside, uh, especially if higher were to rally further from here. The fund can also use derivatives to manage duration risk. Um, and we like the fact that there are actually four senior members in the team. Um, and... Mark Van Hollen has been with uh, the Thread Needle Legacy firm since 1998. Uh, so clearly he is there and uh, he's someone that uh, the rest of the team members can also count on. But most of them uh, have got more than uh, two decades of experience on their own. The credit process uh, is also very strong. So other than the PMs, they are supported by credit analysts on average with 16 years of experience. The PMs do work with the analysts on idea generation and position sizing. So again, it's more of a team approach, right? You don't just get one person making all the decisions. 
So for this one, I would say that on a portfolio basis, try to pair it also with high grade bonds to create your own barbell, which is what we talked about earlier. Higher on one side, high grade on the other side. So certainly not something that you just buy just this one fund, but I would say that you should balance it with others. But at least in terms of uh, risk-adjusted return, it's something that uh, we really like. On to the next one. Uh, so we have two more, and both from Newberger Berman, which is also a new manager that we have partnered with. Newberger Berman is interesting. So they are an independently owned company, privately held. So they are not listed or anything. And uh, the employees do have a uh, stake in the company. And it was founded way back in 1939. Um, today, the headquarters is in New York, but they are in 25 countries with over 2,300 employees. So if you look at the scale, they are very large. They have 402 billion in AUM. Um, and they do have a very strong team in emerging market debt. This fund, again, is very large. It's at 8.3 billion. I like it because uh, it's defensive, it's short duration, while focusing typically at a duration of about two to three years. Currently, it's at 2.48 years. And the year to maturity is over 3%. There has also been uh, consistent uh, capital appreciation, despite that emerging markets uh, was not most favored uh, over the last two years. This year, emerging market has come back. So I think it's something that is worthwhile looking at. Volatility being very low at around 3%, certainly a worthwhile addition to, uh, to add uh, if you're looking at a form of cash plus uh, short duration solution. On to the mix of uh, countries. It is uh, quite mixed back across EM and also LATM. You also do have uh, some government bonds. So in emerging market, you can buy sovereigns, right? You can also buy corporates. So you have a mix of both in this solution. If we look at the fund rationale, this fund uh, has got uh, a view to avoid defaults early and they want to be more defensive with the short duration. So we do like the investment process and we found it to be very robust. The investment team is helmed by a group of PMs who joined from ING. So ING today is also known as uh, NN's uh, investment partners. And the ING team uh, have had a stellar track record with emerging market debt back at uh, uh, their old firm. And this group came together and joined Newberger Berman in 2015. And besides the key PMs, uh, we also have got uh, a strong uh, team of research analysts. Um, and they are actually all in different locations, right? And that helps a lot when it comes to trading. Because with emerging market, you want to be trading in local hours. And if you have got presence in multiple number of EM locations, it helps them get the best pricing and also access uh, to the new issue market. With ESG, this fund um, has uh, Article 8. They also look at ESG risks uh, both at a country level and uh, not just at an issuer level. Issuer level tends to be more frequent, but this one has got a macro country level overlay. And they also make sure that they are excluding securities with an unfavorable ESG rating on at least one of the matrix. This share class pays out fixed payout. It's 4.5%. So I think this is good. There's that stability. Uh, so you just need to be aware that uh, this is a, a slightly different attribute with a fixed payout. Moving on to the last fund on Newberger Berman strategic income. So strategic income is a multi-sector fund. They can do fixed rate as well as floating rate security, and they are more focused on downside protection. Fund incepted back in 2013 and has got 1.8 billion to, uh, in AUM. Uh, fairly low cost, and I would say that this would be a core holding for most uh, investors with a rich credit quality at triple B minus. On to the next page, you'll be able to see the mix. So we have got predominantly corporates and uh, also a stronger bias on North America. And if we look at the rationale, MB has got a very similar process that I mentioned uh, earlier with uh, emerging market. But in this instance, because it's multi-sector, uh, they are also more opportunistic when it comes to rotation, and it will be a more dynamic fund. So what this one is benchmark-oriented and it's not uh, unconstrained per se, 
We have also seen that it's more resilient uh, when it comes to a more volatile market situation. The PMs in this group uh, for strategic income are much, much older. They all have 31 years of average experience. Um, and of course, they leverage a much bigger team um, with about 180 people supporting the different credit analysis and the sector bottom-up approach. So again, the ESG integration is there. Uh, but for this fund, I would suggest that investors look at it as a core fixed income allocation. There is moderate duration and also average investment grade exposure. So I think it's really good quality and something that you can hold for the much longer term. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand the time back to Yulin for a quick demo on how to use Fund Smart and uh, where to find all the different funds that we talk about. Yeah, thanks, Mei Mei, for the very, very comprehensive um, introduction on all of the funds. So now I'm going to do a very quick demo on um, how to use our Fund Smart platform. And thank you all for staying um, till now. Just um, this will be very quick and we will move on to Q&A to answer a few questions. So I'm going to log in to a mock account. And so uh, this, is, this is the user interface after you log into your Indawas account. And you can see the dashboard. You can see your you know, past performance and all your portfolios. So now I'm just going to focus on adding a new goal. Um, and I'm going to go to Fund Smart so that I can select my own funds and customize my portfolio. I can do any name that I want. So I'm just going to give it a random name called DIY. And then here, um, so you can choose general investing, which allows you to invest in equity and fixed income funds. If you go to cash management, uh, it will mainly be um, for you know, your short-term liquidity needs. And you can customize that as well. And you can select your funding source to be your cash or using your SRS account or using your CPF money as well. And the key input here is actually the loss tolerance. Uh, it's really important because we want investors to be clear on how much risk that they can really stomach during market volatility. So this um, scale is actually based on the worst 12 months rolling percentage loss that has happened for the portfolio in the past. So for example, if now I have in mind, I want to um, invest, say, for my parents. So I'm going to be a li little bit more conservative and I will just set my loss tolerance at like 35%. Then I can just go ahead and select eight funds. So because I am being conservative, I'm just going to go for fixed income funds. Okay, so uh, I'll just choose a few funds to illustrate, but it doesn't, um, it's pretty much random. So maybe I'll choose the American income to get US exposure. Then I'll have a dimensional global short-term investment grade to get exposure to um, short duration investment grade um, bonds globally. Then I will just end it off with maybe an Asia bias. So I will just choose Asian Tiger Bond from, from BlackRock. Then I can just adjust my allocation here. So say I want most of my allocation to be in the short-term investment grade because I am on the safer side. And then I'll have 30% weight to Asian Tiger Bond Fund and 30% American income. So that's done. And you have your um, portfolio constructed. Then just need to enter the amount that you want to invest. Say I want to start with $1,000. Just confirm. Um, and then this is, a, I, in my opinion, this is the most powerful feature of FontSmart platform. That is, it aggregates the portfolio for you and shows you portfolio level statistics and analytics. So actually, this one I chose is a little bit too conservative because, as you can see, the worst one year return was only 11.52%. But I can tolerate 35% as I have chosen. And you can see the historical performance. You can see the fund fee, including our Indas fee. And this is a projection for our future um, return based on the Monte Carlo simulation of the historical volatility and performance. And here you can see the holdings on the portfolio level as well, aggregated for you. So I can see the top 10 holdings. 
um, I do have quite a bit of exposure to Asia. So I have exposure to Indonesian um, bond and um, China's government bond, et cetera, and Tencent's um, copper bond as well. And you can see country exposure, they have the most exposures in U US and then followed by Indonesia and China, which is pretty much in line with what I wanted to do. Um, and here is the fees. So actually all of the funds that I have selected use institutional share class. That's why you don't see any rebate here, but the fund level fee is already really low at 55%. Sorry, 0.55%, not 55%. Yeah, and you can see the um, historical performance, we, um, which goes back to 2003, and you can see bouts of volatility during the financial crisis and also during the um, March drawdown last year. And here are more statistics. So yeah, so this is a very simple process. If you are not happy with, you know, any of this, um, for example, this is too conservative, then I can go back and simply change. Or if you just want to buy a single fund, because you already have an allocation elsewhere and you just want to complement it, you can do that just by choosing a single fund, put allocation to 100% and then confirm. So that is um, it for FundSmart platform. Now moving on, um, some people might ask, well, where can I find a list of all funds um, on Indars platform? So actually you can just go to our website, which is uh, indars.com. And if you go to invest with us, then click investment funds list. So here it's a, a table that shows you all the funds that we have on our platform. And you know, it's different, um, the basic information is like, what kind of funding source it can have, the asset classes, geography, we have classified them into different types based on the sector exposure, country exposure and style exposure, as well as the fund level cost, the rebates that you have, the net cost within DAS compared with other platforms. Some funds are ex exclusive in DAS. Um, you can't really purchase those funds on like dollar decks of Fund Supermart. The fund rationale, you can very easily just click into those and see. And you can also see the historical performance, um, which is updated on a monthly basis, as well as its volatility since inception. So this is actually a pretty powerful table, which can allow you to do many things, but you just need to kind of, you know, um, play around with it and understand how to use it. So you can add a filter. So for example, I want to just look at value funds. So I just choose type and choose value, right? Then you can see all the value funds that we have on our platform. So all of those are tech value and some are small cap, some are large cap, then you can, even narrow down further for um, your search. And also you can look at historical performance here. Yeah, so that's it on the demo. I think we can move on to the Q&A session um, quickly, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna stop some questions. So maybe let me start off first uh, while Yulin also look at Slido. And I think one of the key questions that I wanna address is why is it that for some funds we don't see a trailer fee rebate? The answer to that is because we are already using the institutional share class. An institutional share class does not pay a rebate in the first place. You're already getting a, a lower TER. So for some of the illustration, if you realize that there is no rebate, it's just simply because it's already an institutional share class, right? And those share classes just don't have a rebate feature. It's only the retail share classes that have got uh, rebates because retail share classes pay intermediaries a trailer fee and we are passing it back to you. Okay, and from the poll, I'm going to try to address the most uh, popular questions. The first one being, what are the potential implications of future interest rate rise on all these income funds? I think this is a very good question, and we're all concerned about potentially interest rate rising. But the truth is that um, at this juncture, if you are particularly worried, the interest rate will rise uh, quicker compared to, let's say, a projection of 2023 before we see the first rate high, then what you should be doing is looking for short-duration bond funds. These funds are more well-protected uh, in a rising interest rate environment. It doesn't mean that it will have a negative return because uh, it really depends on how fast and furious uh, the rate uh, increases are going to be. 
if you think about the funds, if there is going to be interest rate rising, they're actually buying new issues at a higher yield. So in essence, you can also be getting uh, bonds at uh, a higher return. And generally, when interest rate goes up, that's because the economy is doing well and credit fundamentals will improve. So I would anticipate sectors like corporate bonds as well as uh, securitized uh, assets and high year to be outperforming simply because uh, credit fundamentals are doing better. You can also see spread compression in the environment. Um, and spread compression typically is going to be independent of uh, interest rates uh, rising or not, right? It's just uh, two separate things. But one, we are looking at um, interest rates from a duration standpoint, but there's also something else called spread duration, uh, which is more in terms of credit spread compression. Um, so I would say that income funds, in my view, are relatively well protected as long as you have multiple sources of income. I would certainly try to underweight government bonds, but there are investors who would want a level of safety. You also use it as a hedge in case we have a bigger crisis happening. Let's just assume that if uh, the Indian variant of the virus were to spread to the US and Europe in a, a far more wildfire fashion, as an example, then clearly we are not out of the woods, right? And therefore, you want a hedge to protect uh, on the downside. That would be more of a safe haven trade, and that safe haven trade would come from government bonds uh, outperforming. So that would be how I see it in terms of uh, protection versus uh, interest rates uh, rising. The second question uh, would be what to look out for on FundSmart when you're selecting funds on the platform other than fees as well as your own risk level. And how do we know if the funds are best in class? So for this question, uh, I would say that there are multiple number of factors that we take into consideration in the due diligence and you have already seen us trying to illustrate and highlight what we're looking out for. Um, and there are also actually a lot of quantitative ratios, which we haven't shown you and we do have a model behind it. Uh, so I would say that if you are just picking it out on your own, as certain uh, things like volatility, um, also in terms of the distribution and the payout and credit quality, I think those are important metrics and whether performance has been consistent, right? And I think those would be the key things that are most viable and easy for you to search uh, and, and try and do some comparison. Uh, and whether they are truly best in class, I think this is about your level of trust in us that we have done the homework for you, <laughs> that we have actually gone out of our way to do a full-fledged due diligence process. And that's why we are not a fund supermarket. We don't have all the funds out there just for you to choose on your own. We have curated it for you because we have gone through the full-fledged due diligence process. And what you see is a short list because uh, these are what we deem as the best within the respective peer groups. So maybe, Yulin, are there any questions that you want to take on your side? Um, yeah, I saw that there is um, a pretty popular question on what is the best fund to capitalize on the growth of China in the next 10 years. Um, so we do have a few China funds, actually. And also, I um, think it depends on um, your view on the overall China market, whether you are particularly bullish on, say, just the China A onshore market or the broader regional China. So, you know, China um, equities listed in Hong Kong, or even in NASDAQ. Then um, we have regional China funds available as well. Um, and you can... You can easily filter out the China funds, go into our investment fund list and just choose type and type in, you know, China and China A. Um, so we have one China A fund already from Aberdeen and uh, we are actually doing more due diligence on a few other China A funds that um, offer different, I guess, investment style. Um, and we have, um, I think, I believe we have a FSSA um, regional China Fund and Schroeder's um, Greater China Fund as well, both of which have done really, really well in the past. Uh, and I think in terms of the allocation to China, um, after all, it is still um, a pretty concentrated bet on the rise of China. So I would recommend that you allocate maybe just a portion of your portfolio to um to china maybe five percent ten percent or a little bit more 
um, depending on your conviction on China, I wouldn't allocate a hundred percent of my savings to China. Um, if you are not comfortable with, you know, losing half of it um, when market volatility happens, um, and also if I want to actually prudently grow my wealth over the long term, then I want to spread out my bets a bit more and be more diversified. Yeah. Um, Maybe okay, let me take I the next one, which is on what would be the role that the new income funds play versus uh, the Endowas core advice uh, fixed income portfolios. So we have been receiving feedback from investors that they want a portfolio that's more focused on generating income, which is why we have uh, gone ahead with uh, putting up more income funds. And uh, to your point, if you are not creating your own portfolios, then uh, give us a bit more time. We are actually preparing to come to market with uh, an advice portfolio with income funds. So meaning that we do the portfolio construction for you and you should be expecting different kind of distribution level and you will receive that in cash uh, on a monthly basis. So that's something that's in the works. It would be also advice. But in the meantime, if you are already a super user, you like to do your own portfolio construction, then use the funds that we have uh, curated for you. We also have got new funds that will be coming up uh, over the course of the next month. Um, so certainly there will be a couple more choices. But in essence, I would say that at least the investment objective and the goal that you set for income is very different from the core advice portfolio, which is focused on general wealth accumulation. It's about reinvesting and making sure that you are focusing more on capital appreciation. So I hope that answers uh, your question. Julian, want to take the next one? Yeah, maybe I can take the next one. So there are people um, who are asking fund about fund rationales uh, and prospectus and PHS. Thanks for um, giving us um, the, 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 the credibility of fund rationales that uh, it's good. Um, for prospectus and PHS, there are regulatory documents that MAS require um, fund managers to, to publish when they register the funds in Singapore. And they do contain a lot of information, including a lot of useful information. So if you want um, us to give you a quick guide on like what sections to look out, I think first of all, PHS is a shorter version of prospectus. So it gives you a very good summary of, for example, the investment objective the investment suitability, and a very high-level summary of investment strategy. I think that's the place to start with, and also the cost of the, the fund. So it would list down the management fee as well as the, the total expense ratio, as well as if you look more deeply, the trailer fee rebates that um, the fund manager is paying out of the management fee to the fund, to, to the distributors. Yeah, um, so you know how much you're exactly paying and who you are paying to. And for prospectors, usually I would just jump to the strategy information as an investor and also the key risk considerations. So you can skip like the operational aspect, I think, and just look at what is the, the, the investment strategy. There usually is a section on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, you, can, maybe you, you should take a quick look at the results of the poll so we can announce it. But in the meantime, let me just take one final question uh, before we come towards uh, the 19-minute mark. Um, last question yeah. I want to address is multi-asset funds. I think you guys were asking whether it's useful to use multi-asset funds. Typically, multi-asset funds, you cannot control your own asset allocation because it will be a mix of fixed income, equity, sometimes alternatives uh, in that portfolio, right? And it's just one fund. So if you don't have a desired asset allocation uh, that you want to stick to, you can always buy a multi-asset fund and let the fund manager decide what are the overweights and underweights to do across the different asset classes. However, if you are constructing your own portfolio, you should think about it in, in the form of building blocks, equity, fixed income, uh, as different building blocks. And within that, there are different sectors, countries, uh, and allocations that you're talking about. Countries could be across different regions, sectors could be the thematic ones like technology that you want to be overweighted on. Some people structurally prefer China. Within fixed income, others prefer higher compared to government bonds. So you can manage it on your own if you have got different building blocks that you construct within FundSmart, but that's something that you cannot do if you just buy 
multi-asset funds and it's the fund manager that controls the outcome for you. So those would be the key differences. So with that, Yulin, let's just review the poll results and see what we need to work on in the coming months. So I think the objective sure. of the poll is it, really to get uh, your feedback on what you'd like to see on our platform. And uh, our colleagues kindly sharing the results that it seems that the vast majority wants to have more REITs and income funds. Wow, great. And we are going to be launching our advice portfolios uh, in this area. So do look out for it. It should come um, possibly in the course of the next, uh, I would say, eight weeks. Um, and the other one is thematic investments. So you will also be glad to know that we're working very hard now on due diligence on a number of thematic funds. So you should see them very shortly on our platform. Yulin, any final words? Um, no, um, just want to say thank you all for your support. And uh, we are very excited to grow our FundSmart platform and to offer you more choices at lower cost. Uh, it is, you know, really our mission and vision to um, provide a holistic wealth experience to all of you. And you can reach out to support at indawas.com anytime if you have any more questions. And we will try our best to get back to you within time. Yep. So it's a great pleasure to have you guys join us this evening. Apologize that we overran on time, but I hope that uh, all our inputs were beneficial for you. And we certainly look forward to seeing you again in another Endowas live session. Thank you very much and have a great evening ahead. Thank you.